there's much more work to be done, way beyond what I can do. And I want you to sort of get you excited about what one could do in this space and what there is to come in the research pipeline up ahead for us. So let me do this a uh, bit, bit at a time. And uh, what I, why is this not starting? Hang on. So, oh, connecting helps. So are we now projecting? Yes, perfect. So where are we now? So starting out as we are, so blockchains have become a, uh, one of these words that requires no article. We don't talk about a blockchain, we don't talk about the blockchain, we talk about blockchain. If you walk around in downtown Manhattan and you see two uh, suits discussing uh, FinTech, latest FinTech stuff, one of them will turn to the other and say, what's your strategy for blockchain? The only other word I know that doesn't require an article like this is God. So, uh, <laughs> crypto, cryptocurrencies have become a new asset class. Uh, people have coined the term crypto assets, and uh, the sum total value of such assets is more than $100 billion. Ethereum itself has emerged as a platform for new projects. So there's a lot of money going into startups, at, at least $1.4 billion the last time I tallied this, which was over a year ago. That was traditional VC money. And a lot of the sort of the on-ramps into new projects has turned into ICOs, and ICOs are projected to raise more than a few billion dollars of value in the current year. So, and with Ethereum itself, there's a strong foundation. The EVM works very well. There has never been any downtime since its launch. Solidity is a language that we all have a bunch of wishes from, and it's evolving, and it has been very successful in getting people to think about writing smart contracts. And of course, there's a rich DAP system. If you go around walking in the alleys here, in the, in the hallways, you'll hear everybody talking to everybody else about what their favorite applications are and new, new uh, projects are. And uh, what, did, what happened over there? Okay. How is that? Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, so we have multiple implementations of, uh, of the Ethereum uh, code, or, or the Ethereum virtual machine. There is a, and most importantly, I think this was the, um, the main point that I'm super proud of, that, that makes me really excited when I'm here, is that there's a supportive, constructive, science-driven community. This is worth its weight in any currency plus any other tangible asset you might imagine. That is the, is the actual value proposition of this particular system. So, uh, so let's see, um, what is the significance of all this? What does this mean? So there are three things that really get me excited. The first one is that we're witnessing the emergence of a new class of systems. These are systems with high integrity that can execute programs and give you a strong assurance that they will execute according to how you devise them. Um, they achieve their trustworthiness through auditability and transparency. Based on this uh, foundation, we are seeing the emergence of a new class of financial instruments. Up until a few years ago, the most exciting instrument I could ever get my hands on, and believe me, I tried in upstate New York. It was very, very hard. They made me talk to, when I tried to buy uh, bonds, Russian bonds, they made me talk to a very funny uh, gentleman um, at, at my local bank who told me that I was essentially trying to buy junk bonds and it was going to be very difficult and so forth. But the most exciting financial instrument that I could possibly write, that, that I could get my hands on, was a, was a check. And if I was fancy, I could write a post-dated check and that was it. And now anybody in this room can write all sorts of really fancy, really exciting instruments. And that, of course, means uh, that we can, it's, it's now there's a revolution and it's in the hands of everyone. And finally, and this is prob probably the sort of the most out there claim, there is a new form of social organization afoot. So if I look back at the sort of the history of humanity going back thousands of years, there are some highlights in how people organize themselves. So one of them is perhaps the written laws. Prior to written laws, you, you lived and died at the behest of a ruler. Afterwards, then it's actually you've got some rules and you have some predictability in how your life is going to be managed. Then we have, so again, another highlight is the emergence of the corporation. Now that we have corporations, we don't have personal responsibility for everything we do. The corporation is a virtual entity. And with smart contracts, we now have the ability to have contractual, uh, contractual programs that manage assets that, that can transfer value. So 
Um, so now, that's all nice and fine and good, but where do we end up uh, with challenges ahead? So what, what, do we all, what do we still have to deal with? I believe there are three fundamental challenges in front of us. The first one, as you all know, is scale. Your cousins in Bitcoin land, in fact, many of you are also Bitcoin holders, I assume, are dealing with this day in, day out. And I want to tell you a little bit about this particular dilemma so that you're all well versed in, in the best known on-chain and off-chain scaling solutions. Okay? So the Bitcoin folks, they, they have an information dissemination problem. And uh, they won't really tell you exactly the full story, and it comes with a funny slant depending on which forum you're in. So uh, I want to tell you what we know from, from academics. Second thing I want to talk to you about, and this is where I get kind of blue, uh, blue yonder type um, and talk about things that one could do without a necessarily a solution, is correctness. How do we ensure that smart contracts do what they claim to do? How do we reason about them? And uh, finally, I want to talk to you about privacy, and I want to tell you a little bit about the work that's going on at IC3 um, on how to marry two things that most people consider sort of incompatible, private data with public blockchains. So let's start with the uh, scale issue. And uh, so everybody, I assume, knows the operation of a typical blockchain. You have the notion of, a, of a, some kind of a block, let's say the Genesis block on the left-hand side. You have transactions that are issued. You have miners that collate these transactions into, uh, into blocks. Then they solve some kind of a proof-of-work puzzle, and that allows the system to attach the last block to the previous one. And once they do that, they announce their block, and the, the, uh, the, sort of the miners start building the next block, and the next block, and so forth. This is, uh, of course, we have to incentivize people to do this, and to do that, we give them some kind of a block reward for discovering these blocks. This operation makes it infeasible to modify the past as the attacker, as long as the attacker does not have control of the majority hash power. So if we have blocks like this, and the blockchain is getting uh, extended in some, uh, some, well, you know, in some reasonable uh, form, and you decide to break from the majority. You decide, hey, I'm going to pretend that I did not make that payment to that online merchant. Well, you can do that, but, uh, but without the majority hash power, you will find yourself falling behind and unable to keep up, and your portion of, or your version of the financial history of the world will be pruned, and uh, you'll be cut off. So this is fine and dandy. And at the core of this operation, this is the magic that Nakamoto Consensus gave us. At the core of this operation is this frenetic activity any time a block is found. So every time somebody finds a block, they have to very quickly disseminate it so as to get other people to adopt their version of the reality. And that's a difficult thing to do. Writing protocols where everybody gets access to the same thing at the, about the same time without giving a, some kind of an advantage to the bigger miners is difficult. And that, of course, has led to the uh, Bitcoin community uh, rift. So there has been a civil war in the Bitcoin world over the size of this block size. If you make it too big, then uh, you have this problem that, uh, uh, that big miners have an advantage. In fact, that small miners will want to collate their resources and combine to create a bigger mining pool. Uh, if you make it too small, then you limit your throughput. And exactly where to put that, that knob, where to adjust it, has been the subject of much debate, as you might, might have heard from the Bitcoin folks. In, uh, in Ethereum's case, uh, the blocks come every 14 seconds. The throughput comes out to, realistically, it comes out to seven transactions per second. If uh, all of the uh, transactions were uh, just value transfer, simple transactions, it might be uh, up to about 25 transactions per second. Just so you can visualize what that means, I believe the Bay Bridge in San Francisco is about, about five to seven transactions a second on a busy, busy evening. So that's about the rate we're talking about. Um, like a, an Ikea on a Saturday might be a few transactions per second. And so it's a very hard foundation, it's a very limiting foundation to build a worldwide global transaction system on. So and simply, simply increasing the block size is not a long-term option. So you could up it a little bit. In fact, you could up it, you certainly could up the Bitcoin block size because they're in a very, very low range. 
but you couldn't up it indefinitely. If the blocks were really big, then uh, it, there would not be enough time to build on one before the next one arrives. So what have we done? The academics have looked at this, this, this issue, and what you typically have in bad communities is you have what we call design by gut. A designer, ideally with a big beard, holds his gut and says, well, I feel like this particular block size is the best one. And that's, that's okay. It depends on the sort of the people swaying power of the beard in some sense. Um, but, uh, but really, that's no way to build systems. Okay? The science-driven way to build this is you come up with metrics. You decide what your minimum viable platform is. You then show that the metrics you have chosen, the particular parameters you've chosen, are ideal for what you want to achieve. And to help with this process, at IC3, we came up with some metrics for characterizing Nakamoto consensus protocols. These are things like mining power utilization. Obviously, you want all of the power spent on mining to go into your blockchain. And if that's not happening, there's something wrong. Uh, you want the mining process to be fair, even to small miners. You want the consensus delay to be lo low. And uh, we also came up with two very interesting metrics that I don't have time to go into, time to win and time to prune, uh, that talk about the latency of the process, of the consensus process from the point of view of a miner. And uh, to aid this, we also built a bunch of apparat uh, apparatuses, apparati, or whatever the word is, <laughs> um, for, uh, for experimenting with, uh, with consensus protocols. One thing we built, which is an interesting uh, artifact, is miniature world, a replica of the cryptocurrency world, one for one, in the basement of our computer science department. So for every Bitcoin node out there, we have a replica of it in the department. And work is underway that uh, allows us, that will allow us to have a replica of every Ethereum node as well. These systems are not that big that they could not be replicated, especially given the fact that we don't have to do the mining when we do simulations. We also built relay backbones for, uh, for Bitcoin to, able, to be able to collect data from inside the network. And we operate one of the two backbones for Bitcoin. And uh, so there are some interesting findings that I can share with you. Um, one of them is, uh, the Ethereum system, actually, the, the, the current protocol, incurs many uncles. We end, up, uh, we end up actually wasting some effort in uncle blocks, and that it would be nice to reduce that number. Uh, also, we found that the network, the network would greatly benefit from a relay network. The ecosystem, the Ethereum mining ecosystem, as it is, is more centralized than Bitcoin. That's an interesting finding. And um, there are fewer number of actors that control more of the hash power. It changes from, from week to week, month to month, but overall it's fewer. And, um, and it's an interesting, uh, interesting outcome. But the real issue here is, okay, so this is all fine and good. These are just findings from the current network. Um, how would one make this better? And the funny thing, of course, here is Ethereum is going to switch to proof of stake. So what I'm about to tell you might not necessarily apply, but I want people in this community to know what the best state of the art is. Okay? So the, state, the best state of the art is not let's tweak a parameter. You can only go so far with tweaking parameters. So I want to talk to you a little bit about Bitcoin NG, which is a, uh, a, a protocol for on-chain scaling. And as far as I know, I'll also refer to its cousin Bitcoin at the end. As far as I know, this family is the best on-chain scaling protocol. So, um, so essentially, this starts with a very simple observation. The typical mining process as we know it uh, has blocks that serve two purposes. One is that the block acts as a leader election mechanism. And two, the leader then says, in the preceding block interval, the following things happened. So it's a retrospective protocol. You elect me by chance, and I say, OK, guys, well, this is what happened in the last week. So that's fine. Except if we were to break these two functions apart, we can then end up with much better protocols with much stronger guarantees. So the way we propose to break this up is into key blocks and micro blocks. A key block is the leader election portion of, of a block. And essentially, every now and then, what we do is we elect a leader. And from that point on, that leader vets transactions as they come in, not retrospectively, not retroactively over the last block int interval, but as they happen on the fly. And of course, the key block uh, is related to the micro blocks by a signature. The signature in the, the key in the key block signs the, the, uh, the, the transactions in the micro blocks. So the thing to notice is, of course, that key blocks are very small and rare, and micro blocks are small and frequent. So, and of course, the commonality is they're small. And the smaller they are, the better it is. What we're going to do is we're going to take the process of that frenetic block generation, 
and we'll smear it across time. We won't do it all at once and go crazy and try to scramble. We'll do it slowly. So the way this is going to work is that when it's time to mine something, instead of mining a giant block with everything that's happened in the preceding uh, block interval, we simply mine a simple block that says, hey, this is my key. And that elects the blue leader as the leader. From that point on, he can mint transactions. So whereas he would normally, uh, normally be uh, uh, minting a giant block with transactions in it, now he starts minting them one at a time, linked, of course, in blockchain formation, but without a proof of work. So his proof of work arrives first, and then the rest of the block, the, the rest of the block contents appear one at a time. So this process will lead us with a, to a chain, and at some point, it'll be somebody else's turn. Somebody else will discover a, um, a, uh, a key block, in this case, the yellow leader, and the yellow leader will then start issuing his own blocks, his own microblocks. So the critical part, of course, is uh, that I'm glossing over in this talk, is getting the incentive structure just right. You want the yellow guy to, uh, to attach and extend the longest chain, and you don't want the blue guy withholding any data. You want him to be, uh, to be cooperative. So if you set it up as a set of constraints, the math is a, gets a tiny bit more complicated, but you can come up with the actual, uh, actual incentive structure that will get everybody to behave cooperatively. And, uh, and so in this graph, we're showing uh, what happens to Bitcoin and Bitcoin NG. So Ethereum would actually have the same kind of a graph. So um, uh, on the x-axis is block size. As you go right, it gets bigger. On the y-axis is fairness uh, to smaller miners. And as you can see, as you make the blocks bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, Bitcoin starts, starts deteriorating. Now, these block sizes have been scaled down. And uh, the actual Bitcoin block size debate is being waged in that zone over there, actually, where it just is indistinguishable, but it doesn't matter. Uh, if they were to try to push their block size beyond a particular uh, threshold, they will find that the protocol actually deteriorates. And in contrast, Bitcoin NG does not do that, uh, and it's not surprising because of the way it's structured. So uh, where does this get, take us? Well, it takes us to this, uh, to this location where we can achieve about 300 transactions per second, about an one to two orders of magnitude increase in throughput. And that happens without a change to the trust model. So it's the same, same process as before. And a follow-on work called BizCoin generalizes this idea to a coalition of leaders. So is this good? I think it's okay. Um, it's 300 transactions per second is not quite Google scale. It's not quite Lisa scale. We'd like to do much, much, much better. And, uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about how to do better using help of special hardware. So you've probably heard of Raiden, you've probably heard of the Lightning Network. All of these systems are protocols to take the load off of the, the blockchain into two pairs, two parties that communicate in private and then settle back on the main chain. And these protocols are software-only protocols. And as such, they are subject to one big problem. If I'm a participant in any of these networks, in any of these protocols, I have access to old states. Right? So, so I start out a transaction with you, and at the beginning of time, I have $100, you have $100. I buy something from you, now you have 180, I have 20. I could try to settle using the old state as opposed to the current 180, 20 state. And that's a problem. So this requires, and if we use software, this requires you to constantly monitor the chain so that I don't try to settle early. And that changes the ecosystem. You suddenly start either connecting to the network and watching it like a hawk, or paying someone to do that for you. And who is that someone? It begins to look more and more like a bank, which was the exact same thing that actually tried to get us out of this. Like that was one of the main reasons that I actually got excited about these kinds of systems. The, uh, the system is vulnerable to transaction malleability, and the performance of these software transactions, the software off-chain uh, transaction systems, is limited. So you and I have to sign and re-sign and re-sign new, new transactions uh, for every payment. So let me tell you a little bit about an interesting development that's happening that many people are not aware of. Inside every shipping Intel chip today is what we call a trusted execution environment. This is something far better than a Trezor, something far better than a Ledger. And I'll tell you why. There are two reasons why it's better in, on both dimensions. 
And it's not just Intel, it's also ARM has something called trust zones, and AMD has, a, has similar functionality. So these, this T, this trusted execution environment, provides the notion of high integrity, secure execution. So you can get some code to execute inside the chip, chip unmolested. If a Russian hacker comes into your system and changes your program, uh, what will then happen is that the encryption keys that this program runs under is not accessible even to that new modified program. So it won't be able to read its own data. It won't be able to touch what it touched before. So this is, uh, is one way of, of guaranteeing that the code will only execute and only take those steps that you programmed it to do. And the second feature that these environments give you is remote attestation. Not only is the chip executing code with high integrity, but it's able to tell someone else, hey, inside my enclave, inside my secure inner sanctum, I'm going to execute some code with the following hash. And if you know what that code is, then you know all my future behaviors. And of course, you have to trust that, the, the, that Intel, a company with $56 billion at stake, actually got the T implementation correct. So, uh, so let me tell you what one can do. We developed a protocol for, uh, for value transfers called T-Chan. Uh, very, very quickly, the way this works is as follows. Alice and Bob on the left and right have uh, in their enclaves, inside their T's, uh, two keys. Alice has the green key that commands her green contract, and uh, Bob has the, uh, the orange key that commands his contract. In the initial establishment phase, Alice and Bob securely swap keys with each other after verifying that, that both of them are operating on, on top of T's. So this seems like an anathema. It's like I just gave my key to someone else, but I can do so securely knowing that she can't get my key out. She can only do those things that I authorize her to do. The next thing that the protocol does is make a copy of the contract state into the T's. So now my contract and yours are locked inside my T and your T. And on, on chain, on the actual chain, we freeze the two contracts. So now they can't just mo get modified underneath us. From this point on, I can actually, life goes on, I don't have to monitor the chain at all. We could be in the middle of the Sahara, just the two of us, and I can go back and forth with you um, and, and authorize changes. So in this case, I made a transaction from the green contract to the purple one, and, uh, and the only thing I need to do is get you a message that says, hey, this, this transaction happened, and that changes your state as well. And we can do this all day, back and forth, back and forth, constantly updating our state without having to hit the actual chain. And at some point, we decide to settle, at which point one of us updates the chain with the modified, uh, modified state, and this is going to be a two out of two multi-sig, so that ensures that indeed this is an authorized new state that got updated in private. So this is a pretty nice way of actually doing things off-chain. And uh, uh, we then extended this work to something called T-chain. T-chain is a generalized form of T-chain, uh, except it's actually multi-hop. So in this case, Alice and Bob are not directly communicating with each other. They might have other parties in line, uh, shown here with different colors, and the payments go across multiple parties. And they're guaranteed to be atomic. That is, a transaction will not get stuck in the middle of, let's say, of the country, so I want to pay from New York to San Francisco. My money will not be stuck in some contract in Ohio. It either happens or it doesn't happen. It's atomic. So uh, we implemented this fully. We actually got the keys from Intel to sign it. We have an actual, uh, uh, you know, actual implementation that operates directly on hardware, um, counter to what you know, the Bitcoin trolls make noise about. And we deployed it across the Atlantic. So um, the types of numbers that we are seeing with this, uh, this uh, setup is in excess of 100,000 transactions per second per channel. So if you think about that for a second, that's actually a lot of zeros that takes us into a different domain, and you can have as many channels as you like. Of course, then all sorts of other issues begin to, you, know, you might have to worry about it if you're actually, uh, if you're Bitfinex or if you're, if you're an exchange, you're going to have to worry about actually terminating these, uh, uh, these channels on your end. 
but, um, but the bottom line is this gives you an enormous ability to leverage um, the power of off-chain transactions. The latencies are simply network latencies in this case. And we're currently working to port uh, T-Chain to Ethereum to support Ethereum transactions and protocols uh, or contracts natively on top of T-Chain. Our implementation is, is with Bitcoin. Let me switch gears. So this is, as far as I know, from my perspective, the best of on-chain and off-chain scaling that's re that has been realized to date. Let's talk a little bit about correctness, as, uh, as I'm sure this is a, a critical issue for everybody here who has ever written any line of code for Ethereum. So what do we want to do? We want to be able to verify that smart contracts what do what you think they should do. And this is typically done with the aid of a specification. We write in some other language, typically a very mathematical language, what this contract ought to implement. And then we use lots of techniques from a very rich field called program verification. My colleagues who work on it uh, have been spending decades on this. It's ever since the 60s, people have been paying attention to how do we write bug-free code? It's very, very difficult. This typically falls far short of target. Software verification has focused on two issues, safety and liveness. And I'm here to tell you that there is much more to this domain than safety and liveness. And I'd like to sensitize you to what actually needs to happen, to the research that needs to come. So, um, yeah, okay, so let me, uh, let me expand on this. So, um, so, so far the research has focused on safety and liveness, and, um, and so, I think I've, uh, okay. Um, so what is safety? Safety means that there is no path in a program where a bad thing happens. Because I have a predicate in mind, uh, things like I lose, uh, so the number of tokens coming in is not equal to the amount of money going out. That's a bad thing. That's what happened with the DAO, right? Um, so that shouldn't happen, and if it were to happen, I, want, I, I just want the guarantee that that can never happen in my code. That is a safety criteria, and we understand quite well, actually, the program verification techniques required to check that kind of criteria. Liveness means that always, eventually, something good happens. Okay, so that's a precise statement. So in every path, there is eventually a good thing that you want to have happen. The user is able to withdraw her funds. That should be all possible at all times. So, um, so this, is, uh, this is what this field has really been focused on. Why? Because they've been worried about things like nuclear power reactors being correct. And their safety matters a lot. Their liveness matters a lot. But what they haven't paid attention to are game theoretic properties, which matters to you. And you need to learn to demand this from the researchers. So what's, uh, what's the, yeah, okay, so safety criteria are things like sum total of tokens is less than n, token balances are conserved, this, and liveness criteria are things like the smart contract does not get stuck. In academic parlance, these are all properties. You can reason about them by reasoning about the execution trail, the execution trace of a single smart contract, of a single trace. So I have some code, it follows some path, and on that path, nothing bad should happen. And we know how to check these things. Uh, or it follows some trace, and at the end of that trace, there's something good happening. Again, we, we have techniques. The liveness issues are not as well covered as safety issues, but we have some techniques for them. What we have nothing for, and what I'm here to sort of try to get people excited about, are game theoretic properties. What do they look like? Well, these sound a little bit more nebulous. These are properties like this contract is fair to all participants, okay? So uh, this contract is truthful. It elicits a truthful response the way you actually uh, you know, bid for a truthful bid when you are trying to buy an ENS name. This contract is incentive compatible. Given these incentives, you will do the things that they want you to do. Um, or things like late voters are not disadvantaged, in, as was the case in the DAO. Or this contract is regret-free. If you have the following goals in mind, no matter what you do, as long as you rationally follow these, uh, uh, these steps, you will end up at a good place where you'll be happy. Or most important of all, contract maximizes social utility. 
And that, that word typically doesn't mean much for people, but it really means contract maximizes social outcomes. It makes the most number of people the most happy, if you will. So these are really interesting, and we don't have techniques for actually dealing with them. And uh, to be able to even get at these problems, I think the very first step is to couple a smart contract with, with models of utility and to reason about the contract and the actors uh, in that context. So this requires a set of new techniques that I'm really happy that, to announce that myself, um, uh, Ari Jules and uh, Andrew Myers at Cornell just got a grant to actually explore, um, but, um, but they're not well known and not well appreciated. So uh, the reason why these techniques are difficult is because we're not reasoning about a single trace of a program. To actually reason about these things, these are meta properties. They are not related to a simple prop, they're related to a simple property. Uh, they're not related to a single trace. Regret, for example, explores what happens on all paths. So all, I'm on one particular path, do, are, do, are, uh, are there other paths? where if I were to have followed them, I would have been better off. So that explores a, a combinatorially more exploration of paths and a very more, very much more complicated analysis. So we've begun to study this topic at IC3, but much more work is needed. But I wanted to bring this up in the sense of an academic trying to look at this, this, this uh, situation and try to make sense of what needs to still come. So, um, just in case, don't forget that we actually do need regular good old program verification. Okay, so that still applies. We do need safety criteria. We do need uh, liveness criteria checked for our solidity code. We still need additional mechanisms for solidity. So the language is not enough. We need the runtimes for smart contracts. To that end, there exist entities like Virtual Notary, Town Crier, Oracleize, Augur, and many others that can import real world facts into blockchains and they're very much needed. We still need escape hatches. In fact, we need crowdsourced escape hatches uh, as we proposed shortly in the aftermath of the DAO uh, where you can say things like, well, I want a non-gameable uh, way to stop the, stop, to press the red button when something terrible has happened. How do we build those things? I don't want to privilege the developers and yet I want to be able to stop things when, when bad things happen. And, uh, right, and uh, in fact, many of the problems we found with the DAO, of which the DAO hacker used one, um, plus he used another one, um, many of them were game theoretic bugs. Even if the DAO had not been hacked by that hacker, it would have been hacked by many other hackers in this room. Okay, I'm definitely certain of that. So, uh, so we need mechanisms to, to keep that from happening. So in the last few minutes, I want to talk to you about another topic, privacy and tell you a little bit about some ongoing work. So as you all know, private data and pr public blockchains don't mix. It's very, very difficult to put private information into blockchains because all contract state is public. I cannot, uh, the contracts cannot hold or, uh, or exercise secret keys. I cannot put API keys inside my contract. I would love to be able to have my contract interact with Google services, or interact with uh, with exchanges, but I can't put those private keys inside a contract, that'd be madness. It would be revealed to anybody who decompiles my code. So, uh, but the, and there's much, on, you know, much other uh, private data that we'd like to, to store there. So what can we do? Well, we've been working on something called CredDB. It's a, it used to be called Credible, but we thought it was just, just too hard to type. So it's called CredDB for a credible database. It's a new database implemented on secure hardware. It's uh, not on a chain, but on the network. Imagine a database that's connected to the network, connected to the, uh, the Ethereum blockchain, that gets its commands and API from the blockchain itself, so it's tightly coupled to the blockchain, but keeps its data private off-chain. It's an eidetic database. That is, it remembers everything that ever happened, and you can query for past states. And as I said, it's blockchain driven. Everything that happens to it is stored on a blockchain. It is just like before, just like the T-Chan, T-Chain implementations, relying on some secure hardware uh, that advertises its presence on the blockchain. It attests to the fact that it's running on a T and it holds some private data. And once it's announced this public key on the blockchain, it is now accessible by all. 
Now you can send messages to it, encrypting those messages for that destination so that only this code can decode what it is that you want to read. You want to read some genetic data out of a very private DNA database? You can actually do that. Only that guy will know, and he will access, he will be able to access this. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So the invocation you perform by uh, invoking methods on this item uh, that are encrypted, that you put them as blobs onto this blockchain, send them into the T, and uh, the T will compute on your behalf. You use the blockchain as a rendezvous mechanism, and this entity is essentially a nameless entity. It, it's on the network, but you don't know where it is, and you're not tightly bound to it. You invoke them solely by key. This would be a great way to build decentralized exchanges, for example. And, uh, and so when uh, this thing has computed a result, it can make the result known back on the blockchain and optionally encrypted with the key that you provide so that only you can read it. It's a very uh, self-contained, very simple, straightforward application of T's and blockchains. And what's more is you don't have to have just one of these. You can have as many of them as you like, and they would then form some kind of a, an overlay network on top. So, um, okay, so you can have as many, many such databases and contracts. Okay, so where does that take us? Well, you all have built an amazing planetary scale decentralized computer that ex executes in tandem with high integrity. It's sound, it's secure, and it's got lots of exciting new applications. There are lots of exciting challenges ahead, and I hope I, I, I uh, managed to point out some, some that you knew about, and maybe a few directions that maybe you had not thought about. And most importantly, as I mentioned in the beginning, with a science-driven, constructive community, I look forward to tackling all of them one by one. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Do you want to take a few questions? Sure. If there are questions, I'll take